We talked about the elements of a crime, the necessary elements of a crime. We didn't talk about specific crimes, but every specific crime has an act, a mens rea, and the concurrence of the two. But there's also criminal defenses where a defendant will raise uh, an issue claiming that they shouldn't be charged or found guilty of the particular crime based on certain circumstances. And we call that, generally, we call it a defense. And there's some specific uh, categories, and each category has a type of defense. And we're going to go through those. But basically, in essence, the defendant will claim, I did, uh, yes, I don't refute that I did the act. I did the act, but I was justified in doing it. So it focuses on the act. They claim that they acted reasonable under the circumstances and shouldn't be found guilty. On the other hand, there's elements uh, that attack the mens rea. I didn't have the mental capacity. There was something else, it, and it focuses on the actor, the defendant you know, what what state of mind were they in? What was happening? Again, they ad admit, okay, maybe I did the act, but there was something else where they did not have the free will or they didn't have the mental state. So we called the ones I just explained excuses and the ones where the defendant says they are justified under the circumstances. We call those justification. Was it was the defendant justified in doing the act that the defendant did? So let's talk about some specifics. We're going to talk about the defenses that are under the category of excuse or excused. The defendant is excused from liability. And there are uh, a few of them I might skip out of order. Um, I want to start with insanity. That's a, a term that we're all familiar with in criminal cases. Most TV shows have, you know, well, they were insane. Uh, it's usually raised when somebody is involved in, in a homicide. Uh, we don't use that term, insane. It's kind of in the legal sense. It's uh, kind of delayed description, mental capacity by reason of mental defect or mental illness. I don't use the word insanity in, in the courtroom. And there's four different versions of insanity, uh, depending on which state you reside in. It's going to depend on the test. The most, I'm not going to go through each and every one. I think there's a little blurb, a little box in, in the book that kind of gives you an overview. I'm going to tell you the essence of them all what in in uh, kind of what they all stand for. Um, the most popular one is the McNaughton test. And I'm going to, I think I have a couple uh, videos to show you kind of the, the difference uh, in a case where insanity was successful and one where it's not so successful. And I'll I'll post those and you should take a look at the different uh, videos. I'll reference them. There are two cases, two female cases, Amanda Yates and Susan Smith. Okay. And when you see those, so four different tests dependent on the state, but the gist is mental illness or defect can, I don't want to say get somebody out of a crime, but it has an effect on whether or not they would be found guilty or something else happens to them. And Basically, they're incapable of establishing the mental state, the mens rea. They don't have the right state of mind to commit a crime. They lack capacity for the appreciation that their act was wrong. Um, and in some instances, if, there's, if a defendant is successful in raising such a claim, they're acquitted, meaning found not guilty, and they get to walk out of the courtroom and have a great day. But in most other times, if that is the ruling of the jury or the decision of the jury, um, what they will say is we find the defendant uh, guilty by reason of insanity or reason of mental defect. And then what happens is the punishment isn't incarceration. 
you end up in, in an institution, the judge will order an evaluation and there'll be a recommendation and whatever that recommendation is will be where the defendant goes. And sometimes it's, you know, lifetime in the mental hospital. So that is insanity in its basic general form. If you take criminal law or you have taken criminal law course, you will learn a lot more uh, involved with insanity. Duress. We all, do you know what duress means? It's exactly a defense um, that you're forced to do something. In this case, you'd be forced to commit a crime. Rob, uh, I threaten you, you better you know, rob your neighbor or I'll kill your family. Duress, that would constitute a form of duress. But it doesn't, it doesn't work for the crime of homicide. It's not a defense of duress if the duress is kill your neighbor or I'll kill your family. The, all states don't recognize that, you know, one life over another is, um, is okay. It'd have to be something less, like steal your neighbor's car or I'll shoot you. Now that would be a form of duress. Uh, age, depending on the... Uh, if, let's say, the prosecutor wants to prosecute a 13-year-old for murder, which they do all the time in the state of Florida, they will, if a young person commits homicide, the state of Florida will prosecute as prosecute them as an adult. There's some steps that they have to do. That, uh, actually, no, in New York State, there's some steps that would have to be done if the prosecutor here wanted to prosecute a young person. They'd have to get a court uh, order to do so, to take it out of the juvenile delinquent or the youth court. In Florida, there's no age requirement from what I understand, and that the prosecution is free to prosecute young people. So the defense will argue, well, based on their age, they couldn't have had the necessary mental capacity to commit such a crime. They're too immature, their brain hasn't developed, things like that. So age can be uh, a defense. Intoxication. That is a, a tricky one. It is not a, it's used as a defense, but it's not listed as a actual defense in criminal law. Like these other ones are, you can actually look in the criminal laws of the state and see that duress, insanity, entrapment, and sometimes age um, can be used as a uh, defense. It's specifically stated in a statute. Intoxication is not in its own statute. Ooh, you have the defense of intoxication. So if you were intoxicated, you can get away with not, you know, get away with the crime you just uh, committed. Uh, what happens with intoxication? Um, because people who, let's use drink, um, who drink alcohol, they lose their ability to make like rational decisions because their brain doesn't function correctly any longer, right? So then the question's raised, um, should the loss of rational thinking be considered when prosecuting offenders who, you know, were under the influence at the time? And the prosecutors don't take that into consideration if we're talking about a serious crime if it's a petty a petty thing and they're like oh they're just drunk I can't tell you how many times I've represented young folks in the city of Plattsburgh who may have had a little bit too much to drink downtown and then you know causes some ruckus some disturbance or maybe destroy some property taken down you know signs in front of somebody's house or damaging a street sign oh, those things um the prosecutor would look at like okay intoxicated and age might play a role and they might either not prosecute or just say do some community service or pay for that damage and we'll we'll let it go but when we're talking about a real serious case intoxication um is, is an attack on the mental state, right? Kind of like insanity, but it is 
kind of brought up within the facts of the uh, of the situation. And the judge will re if there is enough facts that establish that the defendant was drinking or intoxicated at the time of the offense, the judge will read a jury instruction that says to the jury that you can consider the defendant's intoxication um, when considering the mental uh, element of this crime. It's not its own. Um, it's not its own defense. If there was its own defense, the judge would have to say, if you find the person was intoxicated and didn't have the right state of mind, you must find them not guilty. That, uh, that's what a statute gives you, is an actual directive from the judge. Otherwise, the judge just says, yeah, you can consider it, the intoxication. And it's very, very hard to be successful on. I've tried it several times. And afterwards, when I talk to juries, I ask specifically whether they thought about the, you know, like if as a defense attorney, when my client was drunk, they're like, Psh, we didn't care. Like they don't, if you, it's, if it's voluntary, they don't particularly care. That's your own. They think of it as that's your own fault. You put yourself there. All right. Entrapment. Entrapment gets a little tricky. There's a lot of misunderstanding uh, re regarding entrapment an act by which a public official induces someone to commit a crime, okay? It's a defense designed to prevent police officers and other government agents from encouraging crimes in order to apprehend uh, people that they wanted for crimes. This is not things like, oh, a street, a speed trap, you know, or, you know, some ad on Craigslist. Yes, law enforcement post ads on Craigslist to kind of flush out criminal behavior. Types of ads they put on are solicitation type ads, looking, you know, young girl, look of lonely 15 year old looking for a good time. And it's, you know, an undercut when the person shows up, there's a little exchange and the person shows up, they find that it's an undercover cop, right? Or the famous example is the undercut, undercover cop presenting themselves as a prostitute. Uh, so those are not acts of entrapment. If it's merely a suggestion, the undercover agent suggests that a crime be committed, but somehow pressures, continues to pressure or induce, now we might give rise to entrapment. So a typical entrapment scenario arises when law enforcement officers use coercion or other overbearing tactics to induce someone to commit a crime. That's what you have to look for. Now think of it as entrapment versus opportunity. Okay, the key aspect of entrapment is the government agents do not entrap defendants simply by offering them an opportunity to commit a crime. So if you have to evaluate whether something's entrapment, ask yourself, is the law enforcement just presenting an opportunity or do we have coercive, overbearing tactics happening here? An entrapment defense arises when the government agents resort to that repugnant kind of behavior, threats, harassment, fraud, or even overflattery to induce defendants to commit crimes. The courts look at people as most, you know, people are going to stray away from engaging in criminal activity, even if presented with, a, with an opportunity. So think opportunity versus entrapment. Two super quick examples, because uh, I know this one kind of gums people up a little bit. Marianne uh, is charged with selling illegal drugs to an undercover police officer. Barry testifies that the drugs were for her personal use and that the reason she sold some of the, uh, sold some to the officer is that at a party, who's at a party, the officer falsely said that she wanted some drugs for her mom who was in a lot of pain. That's what the officer said. According to Barry, the op Mary Ann Barry, the officer even assured Barry that she wasn't a cop and wasn't setting Barry up. The police officer's actions do not amount to entrapment there, okay? Police officers are allowed to tell little white lies or very big lies. The officer gave Barry an opportunity to break the law but the officer did not engage in any extreme or overbearing behavior. All she did was she solicited for drugs and she said 
her mom was in a lot of pain. And she said, oh, and I'm not a, I'm not a cop. Not, that's opportunity. Let's flip it around. So Marianne Barry's charged with selling illegal drugs to an undercover police officer. Barry testifies that the drugs were for my personal use. For nearly two weeks, the undercover officer stopped by my apartment and pleaded with me to sell her some of my stash because her mom was extremely sick and needed the drugs for pain relief. I kept refusing. When the officer told me that the drugs would allow her mother to be comfortable for the few days she had left to live, I broke down and sold her some drugs. Then she arrested me. In that scenario, the undercover's agents, you know, repeated attempts over a course of two weeks and being shut down, that, like, that's entrapment. Okay, I think we covered them all. Ignorance and mistake. These are under the excused uh, defenses. They're raised as a defense. Um, as a general rule, ignorance of the law is no excuse. You can't say, oh, I didn't know that was against the law, or I didn't know that law existed. Oh, I was mistaken as to what that was. That's not a defense, okay? Can't claim ignorance. But what if you have a real mistake in the fact that can excuse criminal responsibility only if it negates the mental state necessary to commit a crime. So for example, Wyatt mistakenly walks off with Julie's briefcase. They're at a popular restaurant. They both have similar briefcases and he picks up hers and leaves. Is that theft? No, because he was mistaken as to the fact, okay? Let's take a, uh, think a drug, a drug dealer. Um, the drug dealer is going to meet someone who contacted him or her regarding getting some cocaine. And the drug dealer now is kind of skeptical. He's getting ready to, he or she's getting ready to go meet this person and kind of gets a bad vibe but doesn't want to miss out on the cash. So he fills a baggie, he or she fills a baggie with uh, candle wax, shaved off candle wax, and goes to meet the person. They make the exchange, and a few moments later, boom, arrested, because the person's an undercover cop, okay? Is there a mistake of fact there? The candle wax mistake of fact? No, because the defendant honestly was putting it out there as cocaine. That was uh, an intentional move to switch it out. It's not a mistake of fact. But let's say we just have a, uh, a they call them a mule, the in-between from the drug dealer to the buyer. And uh, actually, I want, to change my, I want to change my example a little bit. Let's say we have two people who work in a bakery, John and Mark. John and Mark work in a bakery. John says to Mark, hey, Mark, I need you to go deliver this flour over to Marie at the bakery three streets over. Okay. So he does, and Mary pays for it. Mary goes to use her new flour a couple hours later and realizes this stuff is funky. It can't be flour. So she calls her state trooper husband in who inspects it, and lo and behold, it's cocaine. And Mark is arrested for selling cocaine. We have a mistake of fact? Yes, because why? Mark really thought it was, honestly believed it was flour. Okay, so that's the uh, difference between mistake of fact and ignorance of the law. And we just kind of did this quick discussion. I threw it in with regards to uh, intoxication. So if you want to look through that again, maybe raise some of your own opinions. I might revisit that. Let's talk about the justification defenses, okay? Justification. We have one, two, three, four of them. We have four of them. And I'm going to start with self-defense. That's the one everybody knows, right? I was defending myself. And there are some situations where the defendant is justified in, do in doing so, okay? Um, the defendant 
here is not denying that, as I said earlier, not denying that he or she has committed the act. What the defendant is saying is they were justified. So we're now we're focusing on the act. In those excuses, we were focusing on the actor. And justification uh, claims that a defendant's conduct should be legal rather than criminal because it supports some principal value in society. It's for the greater good. Um, let's take this law for example. It's illegal to take somebody else's vehicle without the owner's permission with intent to deprive the owner of the vehicle. Okay? Uh, Joe takes his neighbor's vehicle without her permission. He hotwires it. Sandy calls the cops and says her car has been stolen. Here's the plate information. And then let's say the cops find the vehicle in front of Joe's house. Or they stop it three blocks away with Joe in it. And he's arrested. He took somebody's vehicle without their permission. And the prosecution has to show that he intended to keep that vehicle or sell it. In either some circumstance, he was going to deprive the owner of it. But let's say the cops find it. The vehicle parked at a local hospital parking lot. Cops do an investigation. Joe's in the waiting area, and he admits, yeah, I took the car. But then he also says, I took it because my son stopped breathing, and I needed to rush him to the hospital, and I had no other form of transportation. That justified? If his intent is to return the vehicle back to the neighbor... It seems like he wasn't depriving the neighbor. His intent was to get his son medical help. He'd be justified. That's a form of justification. All right, self-defense. I got a little sidetracked on my self-defense. So, it is usually set forth in a statue. It is in New York, and it's not in New York. It, there's a little, you. it's unique in that the defendant does not have to prove this defense. Generally, a defendant has to prove their defense, and not by a reasonable doubt. They have to prove it by the civil law standard of preponderance of the evidence. We're not going to delve into that. What you need to know is that defenses are generally having to be proven by the defense to a lower standard than the prosecution has. But with self-defense in New York State, the prosecutor has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant was not justified in the, uh, using the action that he took for self-defense. And self-defense operates one of two ways. One, if, let's say there was a, a murder, okay? John is on trial for Mark's murder. John argues, Mark came at me with a knife and we, we fought. I, I got the knife away. He unfortunately was stabbed. And I was justified. If a jury believes that, he will walk out of the courtroom free. But there are some circumstances where it will just reduce the charge. Maybe from murder to manslaughter. Didn't intend to kill this person. Um, it, it was you know going to be an assault. And then they ended up... Somebody ended up dying. They had a fist fight at a bar. He came at me. We started fist, fist fighting. He fell back and he hit his head. That can go one of two ways. But now I'm kind of digressing. So let's talk about self-defense. What do you need for self-defense? The defendant has to be confronted with an unprovoked attack. There has to be a threat of injury or death that's imminent not something in the future i can't call you up on the phone and be like where's the money you owe me if i don't get in 24 hours i'm gonna come over there and beat you up there's no and then i show up in 24 hours and you come out and punch me in the face like there's and you can't use self-defense uh, you know, she said she was gonna do a b and c gotta be provoked they're unprovoked there has to be an unprovoked attack you can't start the trouble the Defendant can't start the action. If the defendant, there's an argument at a bar and the one person, Bob, gets up and shoves Joe 
or begins to punch Joe, and Joe's going to punch back, and um, but misses, and then the other guy ends up killing Joe, right? We have a, a Bob can't say self-defense. Well, he was going to come at me. Well, you started it, okay? So if he's, if it's this, if he's the provoker, you don't get self-defense. So unprovoked, the danger has to be imminent. There, the degree of force used has to be reasonable. So take Bob and Joe in the in the bar. Bar uh, Bob comes at Joe. They got into an argument, and Joe and Bob is gonna. I'm gonna let's go outside. Let's take this outside. Let's use our fists, and then Joe pulls out a gun and shoots him. Not the proper degree of force. You have to have a reasonable degree of force that is used. And the person has to be in reasonable fear of injury or death. I'm going to talk about this reasonableness for a minute. What's reasonableness? If we're deciding what's reasonable, the, the person, an objective person, has to be put in the place of the person faced with the incident. Okay? Is it reasonable for Joe? Would a reasonable person in Joe's position pull out a gun and shoot Bob? And you have to look at it from the point of view of reasonableness. Was Joe in reasonable fear? You have to look at it from the point of a reasonable person. If you were in the situation, would there be reasonable fear of injury or death? Okay? Let's see if I have another accident here oh, another example here how about mike and fred are fighting over their fantasy football stats mike is joking with fred telling him how horrible his picks are and fred is sensitive so he punches mike in the side of the head leaving a big red mark and mike doesn't say anything he shuts up, doesn't say anything, doesn't do anything. After stewing on it, the next morning, Mike shows up at Fred's house. Fred opens the door. Mike punches him in the face. Can he claim self-defense? No. Why? What are we missing? The immediate threat of injury or death. Okay? Um, let's see. Nick is an intruder. He pins Wanda to the floor. Uh, they're in the, in the garage. I have them in the garage. Nick is an intruder, been, and he pins Wanda to the floor of her garage and begins to forcibly remove her clothes off. She feels around on the floor with her hand. She finds a screwdriver and drives it into his neck, killing him. Self-defense? Yes, that is self-defense. You might ask, uh, is that a proper degree of force? Um, we're talking about, you know, you have to be the objective person in that place. We're talking about a one, a one, a woman who is probably less stronger than Nick, the man. She needed a weapon in that particular instance to save herself from rape and possibly kill her. What if that doesn't happen and he finishes raping her and then gets up to leave and starts walking towards the garage door that leads to the outside. While he's fumbling with the lock, she grabs a shovel and slams him over the head, killing him. That is no longer self-defense. That's retaliation. And she might not get charged with murder because of what just happened, but she will be charged with causing his death in some fashion. Let's talk about this duty to retreat and stand your ground. Stand your ground's getting a lot of action these days. Florida is a big state relative to stand your ground, and I hopefully I will clear up the misconception that that law has. In early common law, the defendant had a dirt duty to retreat, meaning you had to get out of a confrontational situation if you could get out of a confrontational situation without getting hurt you needed to get out you have b before you throw down and have a fight or do whatever the next step is stand your ground is you don't have to you don't have that duty to retreat you can use um the force you need and you can stay and stand your ground as long as 
you're not the initial aggressor. You can't provoke the attack. And you are in a place where you're lawfully supposed to be. If you're in somebody's house and this happens and you're not supposed to be there, you're not going to get this, the standard ground. So let's see how this works. And I will tell you, New York State is a duty to retreat state. So if you can safely get out of a situation, you are required. Otherwise, you won't be able to use the self-defense uh, statue. So here is the statue for Stand Your Ground. And, and all it does is eliminate the duty to retreat. It does not eliminate any of those four elements that are in self-defense. So a person is justified in using or threatening to use deadly force if he or she reasonably believes that using or threatening to use such force is necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to himself or herself or another, or to prevent the imminent commission of a forcible felony. A person who uses or threatens to use deadly force in accordance with this law does not have a duty to retreat. The statute in Florida actually says that. Does not have a duty to retreat and has the right to stand his or her ground if the person using or threatening to use the deadly force is not engaged in a criminal activity and is in a place where he or she has a right to be. So what this doesn't do, some people think if you're in an altercation, you can stand there and show down, but you still have to meet these elements. Unprovoked attack, imminent threat of injury, reasonable use of force. If somebody is standing there arguing with you and they give you a shove, and you're like, stand my ground, and you pull out a gun and shoot them, uh, no, that's not going to work. Even though that seems to be the, uh, the mental thought in the state of Florida, because there were several cases after the uh, Trevon Martin case where that young fellow was unfortunately killed by um, Zimmerman, who claimed he was standing his ground, and then there was no other weapon found. Anyway... Don't want to digress here. You just have to know duty to retreat, stand your ground. It's going to be dependent on the state, but regardless, those four elements must be there. All right, let's talk about our other. Oh, I should have talked about the other defenses before I got into self-defense. So I want to talk about necessity, use of force regarding law enforcement, and consent. Let's talk about law enforcement. Since we're talking about using force, when can law enforcement use force in making an arrest? Well, that seems to be the hot topic of now, right? We, we see it. It's, it's out there. But it was defined in the U.S. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court did define it. And, you know, law enforcement can use deadly force as governed by the U.S. Constitution. And the U.S. Supreme Court said that the Fourth Amendment, which is our search and seizure statute, says that uh, law enforcement can search and seize property without probable cause, and it applies, uh, I should say, with probable cause, applies because the use of deadly force is a seizure, uh, seizure. So they can use deadly force if they have probable cause to do so, um, and it has to be reasonable under the circumstances to use deadly force. We have fo using force and using deadly force. So let's put this into context. You can never, they can never use deadly force if we're dealing with a misdemeanor. And they have to reasonably believe the suspect poses a significant threat of death or serious physical injury to others or the officers. That's it. So if somebody's stealing something from, you know, the Walmart or wherever else, and they start running away, and the cops pull up and start shooting, that is not going to be proper use of force. They can never use force for a misdemeanor. Um, if you're being, you know, if someone's being chased by the cops and they stop and they, the, the one who's running stops and turns towards the cops and pulls the gun out of the waistband, yes, you can be shot. 
Um, if you're pulling out a cell phone and they think it's going to be, they can't decide on a moment's notice um, whether or not that's going to be a cell phone or a gun. They're taking in all the circumstances. And if somebody's running from the cops, that's going to be something that they're going to take very serious. Um, this is a tough issue after the um, circumstances that have happened in the last six months. New York State went through a, a huge redefine of laws involving police use of force and you know police protocol. I'm going to drop two right here, but when we talk about law enforcement, I'll talk more about them. One, New York did away with the use of force. They cannot use deadly force. That's gone. It's written in the statute. Can't use deadly force. Um, the other thing that they wrote uh, a law was that the public is free to film, record law enforcement doing their job. And it's sad that that actually had to be written in the statute because it was it's protected under the Constitution as free speech. You are entitled to film the government in public. Uh, police officers don't like that, so a lot of folks were having their cell phones taken from them. I've seen it here in Plattsburgh, They're taken from them or saying, get out of here, put that away, or I'll arrest you for um, uh, dist you know, disturbing the peace or uh, getting involved uh, with our investigation, you know, in hindering our investigation. Uh, the, even the fire, uh, fire folks, too, will, if you're filming, you know, a fire, get out of here, you're, you're disrupting what we're doing. If, you, now, if you're standing behind where you have to be and you're at a safe dif distance, then you are free to do so. But it's sad that we actually had to pass a statute that says that the public is allowed to do that. So anyway, I, di I digress, and that was law enforcement's use of force, and we'll talk more about it when we talk about the cops. Necessity, when you have no choice but to commit a crime, is what that is, the conduct which the actor believes to be necessary to avoid a harm or evil. This is different than duress. Usually it's somebody else causing you to do the conduct. With necessity, you know, let's think you're lost in the woods. You're wandering around the Adirondacks. It's getting hot. It's getting cold. And you break into a cabin, eat some food and drink some water and sleep there for shelter. Did you commit a crime? Sure, you broke in, but you needed to out of necessity. That's how necessity works. And consent, uh, mostly used in sexual offenses, right? Consent is the usual defense that comes when somebody's claiming they were sexually assaulted. Um, but what about assault? Consent. Can you uh, consent to being assaulted? And consent, by the way, note, consent has to be done knowingly and voluntarily done. Uh, consent can also be uh, a defense for someone who cannot form consent. You know, a person's too young, there's a minor. And the uh, statutes set forth specific people who cannot give their consent, people, uh, minors, people who are mentally incompetent, sometimes in some situations, people who are intoxicated. So let's go back to a couple quick examples. Alan is tackled. Allen tackles Brett during a high school football game, and Brett is severely injured. Can Brett sue Allen for assault no because brett consented to being there to play football right there's only a few crimes that consent works with the sexual assault some injury that uh, occurs not much else where this is a couple uh, more examples you are at a college frat party and everyone's drinking away someone decides it would be fun to play the kids game pin the dale pin the tail on the donkey and despite the actual poster of a donkey a party goer who has had several drinks decides he wants to be the ass that everyone can pin the tail on he is stabbed several times in the butt by bob and bob is charged with assault can bob use the defense of consent 
no, because that party goer has probably not been able to give consent knowingly and voluntarily because they were drunk. Joe shows up at the party, and he's sober. Bob grabs Joe and says, hey, go stand in front of the donkey poster and be the frat ass. If you don't, I'll poke you. If you don't, I'll poke your, your eye out. And, and he does, right? And Joe goes, so Joe's like, okay, I'll go. Consent? No, because it was duress. Either go or I'm going to poke your eye out. What if he volunteers? Sure, I'll do it. That sounds like fun. No, can't do it. So I went a little long on the defenses, but those are the general short, uh, general versions of them. If you take criminal law, you'll get a more expansive version. All right. The next uh, area we'll cover is the evolution of criminal law. Before we move on, though, to the evolution of criminal law, one quick point on defenses. Again, like the laws themselves, they're not stagnant. They'll undergo changes depend like I just gave you an example of the changes with regards to law enforcement's use how quickly based on what has happened in in the last few months that New York took changes um, took steps to change the law okay so I do want to note the battered woman syndrome the gulf war syndrome or PTSD syndrome adopted child syndrome these all things these get raised as defenses just a quick note on what they are uh, battered woman syndrome is where a woman, after years of abuse at the hands of their husband, they wake up one day and shoot him while he's sleeping, right? There's no self-defense because there's no in imminent threat uh, of injury or death. But every, the argument is, but every day I've woken up to being afraid of seri being, you know, serious injury. And that has been used as a defense um, PTSD suffered in war, not just the Gulf War and any of any wars, but there's a, just an example, but any of the wars um, can be used. The uh, adopted child syndrome, I don't think it's called, it's not really called that. They call it the child battered syndrome. This uh, does not get a lot of headway. Um, the Melendez brothers who killed their parents tried to use it, didn't work, and I haven't seen it all that much but uh, certainly if a child is it seems like it would work the same as the battered woman syndrome if a child has suffered at the hands of their uh, parents or whoever is in charge of them over the course of their lifetime and they grow up and they are what 17 18, 16 17 18 and one day shoot them kill them that could be used at these are types of things that could be used uh, battered woman syndrome is su really successful and has been successful um, I I'm sure the other two have worked I've never used them myself um, the battered woman syndrome has been around a while so it's had a lot more um, a lot more headway so anyway now we'll move on to the evolution of criminal law 